Eventing is for me the most rewarding and challenging equestrian sport. It includes dressage, show jumping and cross country and it's designed to test the horse and rider to the full. In this program I'm going to demonstrate my methods of achieving a working partnership between you and your horse. Glen Burney is probably the ideal type of event horse in that he's thoroughbred, he's bred to race in actual fact, and that gives him the added stamina and speed required for a three-day event horse. He's got a lovely bold expression in his face and a very impressive upright looking horse. To be critical, he's probably a little steep in his shoulder, which gives him a little bit of a restriction in his working trot but the rest of him makes up for that. He's got a very good foreleg on him, strong limbs, very good quality bone, and a lovely short, strong pastern. He's very deep through his middle, which gives him added heart room and gives him added stamina. Very strong, powerful back on him, which gives you added power and strength for jumping, along with a strong, good hind quarter. Nice laid on hock, good angle, and a very good hind leg. Boy. I think for me, he's probably the ideal type of event horse. The food you feed to your horse is very important. The event horse, like any other athlete, must have a correct diet. There's no secret in what you feed your horse, but the main thing is that it's the best quality food available. Our horses get hay ad lib, in that they're never without a hay net unless it's prior to work. If there is a problem with the hay or the horse has any particular dust allergy, then we put the hay through this dust care machine. I feed the horses on a daily routine in that I feed according to how they're working, how they're performing and how they're looking. The main ingredients that I feed my horses are bruised oats, badminton horse feeds, horse and pony nuts, or event nuts, and a high protein course mix. These are what give the horses the energy and the protein that make them perform well. And to complement them, we feed a variety of chaff that's been treated with molasses. We also feed beet pulp, which must be soaked for a minimum of 24 hours. And that's going to give the horse all the added bulk that's necessary. Any added vitamins or minerals that you want to give to your horse can be given when you feel the need. However, to get full value from your horse's diet, it must be free from parasite. One of the most serious risks to your horse's health is the internal parasite. Horses harbour at least 75 kinds of parasites that live in the lungs, liver, blood vessels and digestive tract. Some are just annoying and uninvited guests. Others are pathogenic, causing diseases in horses which may affect their ability to convert feed and to maintain body weight or to reach their full genetic potential and to perform at their best. Sometimes they can cause death. The signs of a worm burden may be as subtle as a change in disposition, a sudden dullness of coat or a lifeless step. Your horse may look healthy, but parasites are a hidden, sometimes deadly enemy, which in a few short weeks can sabotage months and even years of condition. Nearly all parasites are hard to get rid of, simply because horses' stalls, paddocks, pastures and parasites add up to an integrated system that perpetuates infection and infestation. The horse contaminates the pasture and the pasture in turn infects the horse. It's a vicious cycle. Here's the way it works. In the typical life cycle, 
Adult worms lay eggs which pass out in the manure. The eggs of some parasites are very resistant and can survive in the environment, whether in stall walls or in bedding. Larvae or immature worms develop in the eggs which survive in water droplets in the grass, waiting for grazing horses to consume them. It is well accepted that the immature stage of the common bloodworms, Strongylus vulgaris, can be a major cause of serious colic in horses. In the arterial system, the mature fourth stage larvae and the young adults migrate down the lumen of the arteries and back into the intestine. There they develop into adults, produce eggs and begin the life cycle over again. The life cycle takes approximately six months or longer before eggs show up in the faeces, during which time the infection is difficult to diagnose. Another annoying parasite that plagues the horse is the bot. Stomach bots are parasites, but they are not true worms. Rather, they are actually the larvae of the bot flies you've seen buzzing around a horse's forelegs. The fly lays eggs on the body hairs, usually on the horse's forelegs, chin and throat. The eggs are licked off and hatch in the mouth. If left untreated, heavy worm and bot infections can eventually produce a long and sadly familiar list of visible signs. What many horse owners may not realise is that parasites can and do kill horses, often with no warning signals, no outward signs of infection. Effective parasite control is aimed at prevention of clinical disease in the host by eliminating adult and larval stages of the roundworms. This achieves another major goal, that of preventing contamination of pasture by worm eggs in the dung. Hi, Rotty. No horse is immune to internal parasites. Even high performance horses need routine worming. I treat all my horses with equivalent paste regularly. This stops the bloodworm larvae before it can damage the arteries and avoids the dangerous buildup of other disease causing parasites, including small strongills. So, what is Jewish worming now? Without any fuss, pop the dispenser in the side of his mouth, point it to the back of the mouth and push the plunger. Then I'm sure my horse is healthy. It is of great importance that I plan an effective fitness program for both horse and rider. When I first bring the horse into work, I start with half an hour road walking, building up to one and a half hours after two weeks, by which time the horse's legs have had a chance to harden up before I start hill work. I do very little trotting on the roads, and it must always be uphill to avoid concussion and jarring. There is no point in having a fit horse and an unfit rider, which is why I work out as well as ride five or six horses a day. From my point of view, I don't do interval training, 
as from my base in Scotland I'm surrounded by hills of different gradients. I would have to rethink my fitness program if there were no hills available. My fast work program is similar to that of racehorses in that I do canter every fourth day, building up from slow canter to never more than three quarter speed gallop. The speed and distance varies according to the type of horse, but the maximum distance would be two miles, broken down into two or three canters, at half speed, being between 14 and 15 miles per hour, with a final half mile slightly faster. Before we go on to cross-country jump, we're just working these two young riders on their horses on our outdoor arena. Charlotte Nicholl is riding her bay intermediate eight-year-old, Kerry, and Daniel Hughes is riding his novice grey mare, Cleopatra, who's six. We're working on a parkway Posada surface, and for me, it's probably the best on the market, as it enables us to work our horses 12 months of the year, regardless of weather conditions. Okay, if you just turn in now. Good boy, well done. To ride cross country, it's important that we're wearing the correct equipment. Charlotte's wearing the correct safety hat. It's a crash hat with a safety harness that has been approved by the British Horse Society. She's got a riding hunting tie on, no hunting pin, as that would add to the risk of riding cross country in the event of a fall. She's got a body protector on, either a back protector or a body protector is quite adequate, but this full body protector gives all round protection, including all the way down to the base of the spine. So now that we're safe and happy, let's go and ride cross country. Once the horse is sufficiently fit, it's time to start working at speed over jumps. It's important to keep balance and rhythm throughout and that we maintain the horse's confidence throughout its training. 
Okay, that's fine. Perhaps you would be wanting to be a, a fraction more ongoing when it comes to jumping the fences. Um, if just one at a time you just jump this post rail in front of me, in canter, and turn and come back. Charles, if you hold on till Daniel's been. Think about how you would be when you're on a course. OK, very nice away, but there isn't really any need at this stage to start angling the practice fence. Perhaps it'd be better to think about being straight at the fence. But she jumped it well. OK, good. But neither of you particularly thought about turning back to the fence. You've got to think about where you are on a cross-country course. There's no point in waiting till you get to halfway across the field in the wrong direction. You've got to think as you're jumping a fence where the next fence is. So let's string a few fences together. If you jump this same post and rail to begin with, circle right up the steps of the bank and off the end, over the coffin at the far end, the trochaner, and then the small Normandy bank back to us. OK, Daniel, if you go first. I want you to keep a rhythm and think about the speed you're riding at. Nice flowing stride, nice rhythm maintained throughout, which is what we want to see. Perhaps the rider could have been a bit freer with his arms over that. The horse had to jump with its head in the air and make it a bit hollow. Good. OK, that was very nice. The only criticism I would have was that you didn't allow the horse to use its head and neck over the trochaner. You didn't really free the rein over the fence, a little bit strangling, and it made the horse have to do a cat jump because it had to land on all four legs so there was no freedom of rein. But it was a nice rhythm and you were looking where you were going and thinking about things. When you're ready, Charlotte. All the gymnastic work that we do over the show jumps is where the horses learn how to look after themselves when they're cross country. And if all of that has gone well, then there's no reason why the horses should stop, provided the training has been thorough. If a horse ever does stop, then it must be corrected immediately. And we could see going into the coffin there, when he was on a slightly close stride to the fence, he had been taught through his training that he could snap up and get out of the difficulty. Lovely over the trochaner. OK, good. Steady. day. OK. That was very nice. He was super going into the coffin because he was very quick because he got a little bit close to it. But a lovely rhythm. He looks just a little bit keen there, a little bit strong. But it's very nice. He knows what he's doing. OK, let's do a different line of fences, making it a little bit more difficult. And we'll include this time jumping onto the river bank into the darkness. So if you go over the rails at the top of the fence line, the trochaner, 
down over the big bit of the Normandy bank, and then jump in the left-hand side into the river and round and out to the right side. Again, maintaining that rhythm. Always make the first few fences when you're schooling and training your horse over cross country. Make them a little bit easier and then gradually build them up to the slightly more difficult fences. Lovely. And then down to this quite big Normandy bank. Good. They had enough impulsion so that when the horse got a little bit close, it could still bounce out over the rails. learns that it can jump into the unknown because it trusts the rider. Very good. Super. Make much of her. Tell her she's good. That was lovely. OK, Charlotte, when you're ready. That was actually more flowing than the first time, and she looked as though she was going on that bit nicer. Perhaps a little bit fast. The horse is beginning to pull a little bit with Charlotte. Wasn't really concentrating on the fence. But as you get the fences bigger there at the trochaner, it steadied itself and thought more about the jump. And again there, it was a bigger fence, so it steadied itself up and made the alterations. Good. Okay. A little bit too fast and strong at the first fence, but once the, fence, the jumps became a little more difficult, he started to listen and concentrate on what was happening. I think perhaps the, the fences are probably too small for him in general. I'm quite sure that once you get to the cross-country course in a competition, that he has more to look at and that he's concentrating a bit more and he's not quite so strong. Well done. To be sure that I ride at the correct speed and rhythm across country, I canter my horses alongside a car that maintains a set speed dictated by the rules of the competition. By doing this with each horse, I can then gauge how quickly my horses cover the ground to maintain that speed. I've come to Thurlston Castle to walk the cross-country course. What we have to remember is that the horses never get a chance to see the fences, and so this course walk is all important, in that we get a look at the fences, the landings and the takeoffs. We can look at the lay of the land and know exactly where we're going. There's a large difference between walking the cross-country course at a one-day event and at a three-day event. At a three-day event, we can walk the course a minimum of three times. The first initial walk is simply to look at the course, see what the fences are like and where we're going. The second walk is probably all important in that we look at all the alternatives and know where it is possible to jump the fences. The third and final course walk is simply that we 
walk the course where we plan to ride it when we get to the cross-country competition. Whereas at a one-day event, the chances are we will only get time available to walk the course once. Let's go and have a walk now. As this is a one-day event, the chances are we're only going to have time to walk the course once. So make sure you walk the course thoroughly and have a look at every alternative at every fence. Because it's a once only walk, as you approach the fence, try to assess what the jump is, look at the flags, make sure you know how many elements there are to jump and see which way you decide to, to make the operation a success. This fence in particular, the quick way is just one elevation, but there is an alternative on the left which shows two different fences. Out of choice, my preference would always be to go straight over the quicker alternative, but it always depends on the ground conditions and the weather conditions at the time. Always being in the middle of the fence, there's no need to angle the fence unless it's a particular angled rail fence that you're approaching. Be in the middle, look at the ground, look at the landing and assess the fence that you meet. We've got a nice takeoff rail here of a sleeper to a parallel. The actual jump itself, although perhaps quite wide, is not particularly big. What is going to be the biggest problem is the fact that we're, we've got a big ditch underneath the fence which if the horse is young or inexperienced, it perhaps would look into the ditch rather than concentrate on the top of the fence. So the main thing is that you keep them concentrating and looking ahead to where they're going. If you've got the approach all right, the speed and the rhythm correct, the horse should be confident enough to jump it. But you have to make sure you know exactly what the landing's like, whether it's flat ground, rising, or a runaway down a hill. Here we've got a nice gentle slope away from the fence, which is probably the best type of landing for a horse. As this is a slightly downhill approach to such a big fence, I want to be sure that I set the horse up, keeping him well together so that he meets it on a good stride to stretch through the air, whilst I already have my eye fixed on the next jump. Although when approaching the fence, a rider always has a preference of which way to go, make sure you know exactly what the alternatives are offering. To jump this or the alternative, there's two elements. There's an upright with a parallel beyond. So the quickest and most direct route is to be straight in the middle of this upright and out over the parallel beyond. Measure the distance between the elements so that you know exactly what speed you've got to ride the fence at. A perfect one stride, a nice easy alternative for the more difficult parallel with the big ditch. We're now going to jump the alternative to the big parallel and ditch. The ground's a bit slippery, so we want to have a lot of balance, a bit of impulsion. <laughs> An even easier alternative would be to walk from this upright across at the angle to the upright on the way out. So there's actually no spread fence involved. A perfect two strides, but you're actually going to have to jump the way out over an angled rail but it is quite small, so there shouldn't be a problem. The third, probably the most difficult of the alternatives, would be a bounce fence, where you'd have to approach the fence on the angled rail and jump out over another angled rail with just a bounce in between. And depending on your horse, you could alter the position whether you wanted less distance or more distance. As we've already said, the landing is just as important as the approach to the fence. Make sure you land and take the correct line that you want. 
and that you look back over your shoulders between the fence you've just jumped and the next fence, it's going to make sure that you have the most direct line available. Coming to the water fence, you want to have a good, strong, collected canter with lots of impulsion so that the horse has got his hocks engaged, ready to jump in. The most direct route is over this quite small log and land on a short bank before you pop into the water. This isn't very big, but it's the problem of make, asking the horse to jump into the water that, that is the difficulty of this fence. The alternative way to jump into the fence is round the corner where you can jump again a small log onto the bank and then you would turn to jump into the water. The problem with that is this turning to go into the water but there isn't in fact a straight line into the water over this fence. The other third alternative is a very very low log but it's a direct jump into water and in fact although it's the smallest jump is actually probably the most difficult from the point of view of going straight into the water. We've got to walk the distance on the bank into the water now. It walks as a bounce for the horses, but the chances are because they're jumping into water, they'll put a stride in. That doesn't particularly matter at this stage, provided they're still thinking positively forward. We've got to walk the distance in the water and also to check that the bottom's okay for the horses and that we're not going to find any holes or loose gravel on the bottom. The distance in the water measures two strides, but the young green uncertain horse is not going to jump boldly into the water so he'll probably put in three strides. That doesn't matter provided there's enough impulsion and the riders going forward to jump out the log out of this side of the water. An alternative fence to get out which would make it easier for the horse is this log on the left. Provided you've jumped in straight and everything's going all right there's no reason why we shouldn't be jumping straight out of the bigger log and as soon as you've landed then you've got to concentrate immediately on the log out. It doesn't particularly matter the distance between the log out of the water and this log here. The main thing is it's uphill, you need lots of leg on, lots of impulsion, so that the horse has got enough energy and engine working to jump this log. As soon as you've cleared this log, concentrate immediately on your line to the next fence. Glen Burnie is on a good stride over the rails onto the bank but isn't really listening, so is slightly taken by surprise when he sees the water and makes a very uncomfortable jump in. He then very quickly regains his balance and jumps out well. When we retake the fence, he is much more aware of what is happening he concentrates well and makes nothing of the jump. The approach to the coffin fence, or in this case a double coffin, in that it's got two ditches in the middle, is very similar to that of the water jump in that you want the horse to be well collected with lots of impulsion but because it's a downhill approach not too fast. Jumping in over the initial rail is the main problem to the coffin fence as the horses could be looking ahead into the ditches and any horse that's a little bit wary of ditches is going to perhaps have a stop here. 
but provided you get in over the initial rail, the rest of the fence looks after itself. Once you're in over the initial rail, it's a case of the rider sitting up with lots of leg on and encouraging the horse to go forward over the ditches. A perfect one stride between the rails and the ditch, another very quick stride between the ditches, and then another one perfect stride out over these rails and off you go looking for the next fence. A very balanced approach means that Glen Burnie is concentrating and jumps in well over the rails. He takes one stride and is a little far off the ditch, so touches one foot down again before jumping, showing how clever and athletic he is. A very quick stride to the second ditch and again well out over the rails. The easiest alternative, which would obviously be the most time consuming at this fence, is to jump the rails on the right by the red flag, go round the outside of the tree and jump the opposite rails by the opposite red flag on the far side. That is two simple fences, but obviously, as I say, very time consuming. The most direct route is straight here over this narrow parallel, which although is not a terribly big fence, it's very narrow and it would be very easy for the horses to shy away from this tree here and run out. So you want complete accuracy and a very obedient horse to jump this. Being very attentive, Glen Burnie stays straight and makes nothing of the jump. Another alternative would be the bounce through these angled rails. Again, not a very big fence and also quite a nice distance for a bounce, but the problems here would be that once you've jumped in, the horse would run off down this chute to the right. Because of this angled rail, it's encouraging them to go off right. So not perhaps the easiest of bounces. The last alternative, which wouldn't be very inviting to the horse, is to jump straight in at the end of these rails. Again, very narrow approach. The biggest problem is there's no room to land between these two posts, and they're jumping straight into this tree, which would put them off. So my preference would be to jump through the parallel on the quickest, straightest route. Because the horse is going and jumping confidently, I'm able to look ahead and concentrate on the next jump. Probably the most influential part of this second water complex is the fact that we've got this bump on the approach, some two or three strides before the fence. And that's going to influence the entire way the horse approaches and jumps the fence. Having kept the balance over the bump, then the rest of the approach should look after itself but we've got two rails before we jump into the water. And to me from here, the problem is that we've got quite a long two strides before this second rail. So let's pace it. It isn't desperately long, but because of the bump, we're not going to have jumped the first rails quite as boldly as we would like to. And therefore we may be a little bit far off the second rail, which is gonna mean a, a slightly flat not a very good jump onto the river bank. Ideally, we would like to be quite bold at the first rail, powerfully forward to the second rail, so that we're holding the horses off slightly. And if we can't do that, then the chances are they might put in a little hesitation before takeoff.
but a perfect bounce on the landing of the bank before we pop into the water and off we go to the next fence. Getting a little close to the rails in means that Glen Burnie doesn't jump into the middle far enough so he's a long way off the second rails. Because he is being careful and tries to back off the rails, he slides along and has to be very quick to jump without hitting the fence. Then he has a rather untidy jump into the water. This time we meet the rails on a good stride, jumping much further into the combination, meeting the second rails on a perfect stride with an easy bounce into the water. I am now arriving at Poker Hall Horse Trials, where all our practice is put to the test. A good jump off the bank, but the horse throws the rider forward out of balance, and he uses that as an excuse to run out at the rails. The horse has decided that he has had enough. The end of the day for that competitor. Very bold and balanced and lovely style. This horse has not quite enough impulsion or speed on the approach, so doesn't quite make the distance on the second step, but he recovers well to jump the log. So now we go on to look at the advanced horses jumping the water fence. We see how quick and careful the horse has got to be when the elements come up very quickly. The horse altering its stride to jump down the first step, having a look down his nose at the water, but making a very nice, definite, positive jump in and well out again. If the horse is balanced at the first rail, the rest of the jump follows naturally, provided the horse is brave enough to go on into the water. All the time we can see how much concentration the horse has to put in and how much of an effort the rider has to make to keep the horse listening and concentrating. If they're too bold jumping into the water, it causes problems on the way out as there isn't enough room for a stride in the water. But when the fence is jumped correctly, it shows how easy it looks for the horse. Here Sir Watty is jumping very well and showing all his years of experience at cross country. 
A little bit later, Murphy himself jumps in rather boldly. He then bounces the water instead of putting in a stride, and so I have to give him all his head and freedom to allow him to make a good recovery. A very honest horse. Douglas, and you're ready. Just keep him in the shade so that he doesn't get too hot. Once we've seen to the horse's welfare, there's time to relax and chat about the day's proceedings before the prize giving. Scotty. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, where's well. my drink then? You, you want a break? Have a drink. Thank you. Cheers, old boy. Cheers. Got a bit over with then. Mm. But it, um, old Murphy went well, thanks to you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm so I'm very good. He wouldn't, didn't get strong then. And... No, he didn't. I mean, he, he's strong, but you know, remember you said to me if you sit up, he comes back mm. to you. And I mean, he does exactly that. Oh, that's great. Um, except for the water, where I thought I was riding water instead of Murphy. Yeah. And he bounced it <laughs> one stride and said, "God." So, but he sorted that. I don't mind. That's great. <laughs> He just I says think, still you idiot. Yeah, I think it, I think it's doing good, making him back off a bit. Because uh, the thing is, if you look will. after them all the time, like I did, <laughs> then they, they learn to yeah. rely on you so much. Well, he was a bit surprised when he made a mistake, but um, he's so clever. It's yeah. Really hard, so it's quite good. But there's always the pressure at a sort of final trial, isn't there? I mean, you, yeah, you I'm never, sure that's what you're never is, quite though. sure how they're going to go, and you're trying your hardest, and then something goes wrong. Yeah. I think that's all it's all about. Both of them just the advanced section goes to number 72, the man himself, Ian Stark, with the Edinburgh Willow Mills Murphy himself on a score of 41. And second to Badminton this year, Ian Stark with the Edinburgh Willow Mills Sawati with a score of 45. Whether you ride at pony club or international level, to achieve the best results requires practice, dedication and hard work. There's no magic formula, but the main thing is that you enjoy what you're doing. <laughs> 